You know, the, thankfully, I don't really have a whole a big problem with pride. I'm really proud of that. And actually, <laughs> how do you do this? Let's see. I'm, you know, I'm going to fix this right here. See if I can lift this up. Because, I mean, I've never really had a proud, proud bone in my body. I mean, I, I've been around. I know a lot. I can tell people how to do things and nobody really listens to me because the fact matter is um, I, I just don't want to, you know, I just don't want to be a real bragging all the time about a lot of things. I don't want to be proud. But <laughs> who was that guy? There are some people. I'll tell you, there are some people, though, who could probably use a little help. And, I, I mean, uh, just the other day, I was driving uptown to get a burrito, and this guy cuts in front of me, and, I mean, cut right in front of me. What an idiot! I mean, where do people like that learn how to drive? I, mean, I had to look twice to make sure it wasn't a woman driving, because you know how that is. But here's the problem. You see, I was, I was driving on my way to get this burrito, and I, the weather must be warming up. Because there was this guy standing on the corner, holding up a sign, and it said, hungry, need food. And I looked at that tall, strapping guy, and I said, ha, get a job. And by the way, why do you have that dog? Don't you know that's two mouths to feed? Probably all the money I give you is going to go to dog food and booze anyway. But here's the big question I got for you. Not that I'm an expert or anything, but where did you get the magic marker? I mean, the print is bold and blocked and it looks really good. And I'm thinking, there must be a magic marker warehouse for homeless people somewhere. And that really makes me worry what's going on in the world. But at least, you know, I mean, I could just look at him and say, at least I'm not standing on the corner begging. But when they do get a job, you know, it's not a whole lot better. Because actually, there's this burrito shop. And I go in and I order my burrito. And then this guy comes shuffling out. And he's got a scraggly beard, and he's got tattoos from his ear to his elbow. He's got more metal in his face than the man with the iron mask. And he just shoves that food over to me, and I'm hoping that there's not a dreadful disease in it. Because I look at it and say, what's wrong with this guy? I mean, no wonder he can't get a better job than working in the kitchen making burritos. Now, now I don't want to judge. I mean, I grew up poor, I worked hard, I went to school, I earned a PhD, I worked really hard. And you know what? I didn't have to do it with ink and tattoos and metal and a man bun. But here's the real problem, is that, is they're all millennials. Now, there's the real problem. There, there's the problem because, you know, I mean, I don't want to talk down, but, you know, millennials, I mean, snowflake video gamers. What's the world coming to? How are they ever going to get a job? They just want to be applauded and coddled and they make fun of us old people who created the whole world and fix it for them so that they could have it. And you know, I, I just don't know how it's going to work out. I mean, I mean, I don't spend all day posting funny pictures of my cat on Facebook. I get up and go to work. Speaking of which, I left the burrito shop, drove out into the street, and you know what happened the first thing? Yep, I hit a pothole. And then another pothole. And then another pothole. I thought, what is wrong with this county? Why can't they fix the potholes? Now, I'm not an expert. I don't really know a lot about all that kind of stuff. But I tell you what, I see those guys leaning down their shovels and standing around those potholes. And I think, I can fix a pothole. I can put the asphalt in there. I can make it smooth. I mean, my truck has more rattles in it than a baby buggy. And I'm still just driving over potholes. I cannot figure out what's wrong with this. Speaking of rattling around, you know what I've been doing the last few years? I've been visiting churches. And churches are in a mess. In fact, I think a whole lot of churches are just going downhill. I haven't been to a church in the last two years that I think I would attend regularly, no offense. But you know what the problem is? Churches just can't figure out what they're doing. I mean, they can't figure out what kind of music to sing, what kind of style to follow. They're supposed to be contemporary, they're supposed to be traditional, and the traditional people that sing the hymns think those people that sing contemporary songs are shallow, and those shallow people that sing the hymns, the contemporary songs think those hymn singers are old fogies. They can't figure out what Bible to use. Is it KJV? Is it NIV? Is it the cool new hip ESV? I mean, you know, what? just what? And here's the deal. I, I've been around. I know a lot about church. 
I mean, I, I don't want to brag, but I could tell them if they would listen how they could probably fix their church. You know, the liturgicals are stuck in the 16th century. The Pentecostals are just jumping around, making a lot of noise and hollering. It's just a big mess. Why don't they listen? I can kind of help them out. But here's the big problem. It's the... Uh, well, I started to say... Well, I started to say politicians. You know, but that's a whole mess in itself. And what are you going to do with liberals and progressives and Trump and everything else? I'm not a politician. I don't want to brag. But, you know, I could probably tell them how to fix things if they just pay attention. But I do have a lot of things to say about them. But what I meant to say was preachers. Preachers are really the biggest problem in churches. You know what the problem with preachers is? They talk, 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 talk. And they don't listen. And you know what they'll do on Monday morning? They will brag to you about how big their church is and they always round up to the nearest hundred. Every time. And then they'll say, hey, and guess what I preached on yesterday? And I'll say, I don't want to know what you preached on. Don't tell me what you preached about. I don't want to hear what you preached about. I want to tell you what I preached about. That's what you need to hear. Because it probably do you some good. I mean, I don't want to brag. I'm not an expert in everything, but I can help if they'd listen. They just don't listen very well. The problem is they just really brag too much. And, well, I'm thankful that I don't have a problem with pride. Okay, did I succeed in offending just about everybody? <laughs> no, let me keep going. Keep trying. Oh, mercy. Well, you know what? I really don't like talking like that. I really don't. Because that's, that's kind of that's ugly, isn't it? But it's also, uh, I'd like to think it was tongue in cheek, but mostly it's uh, kind of confessional. Mostly, sadly, it's kind of looking in a mirror. I talk like that because I do often hear those kinds of words if not coming out of my mouth flitting through my mind I'm not proud of that in fact that kind of hurts it makes me a little bit queasy you see the pride we're going to talk a little bit about pride today the pride that's really obvious in people the uh, the people who put on airs, who are outright arrogant and condescending and conceited. And here, you know who I'm thinking about? Think about the, uh, the uh, king and queen from the castle next door in the Bud Light commercial. You know, the long curly hair and the hat and the makeup. So you know who I'm talking about. When, when we think about those kind of people, oh, our castle is so much brighter. Oh, our people are so much better dancers. Oh, our drink, mead, of course, is so much better. You, you know, those kind of people we can almost kind of laugh at, almost kind of shrug off, we can cringe. We can avoid them because we see it outright. The real danger with pride is much more subtle. Augustine called pride the root of all sin. The first sin and the worst sin. Probably the root that is, the, the sin that's at the root of, of our worst behavior at every point. We're going to explore that a little bit today. The thing in us that makes us think we're the center of the universe, whether we say that out loud or not, we'll, we'll often think, you know, the world revolves around me. That makes us think that we're more than we are, that we're all that, or at least we're a little bit better, a little bit higher than the other people that we're around which enables us to criticize so easily. That's the pride that's most insidious, most damaging, most destructive, most divisive, most hurtful, and it's everywhere. It's the pride that's easiest to justify and to ignore. Well, the Bible goes right to the heart of the condition. Now, actually, I think there was a handout that, that you got. And if you don't like to write, or you, 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 know, you know what handouts are really good for, if you don't want to use them, is coloring in the E's and the O's. It makes time go by really fast. So you do with it what you will. In fact, I was going to make it, I confess this morning, I was going to make it a half page so it would be much easier to manage. But when I printed it, it came out a full page. So you got a whole page there to scribble on. But let's, let's address that for a moment. The Bible goes right to the heart of this condition of pride. What does Satan say to Eve? Are you kidding? You can be like God. You know, he struck right at the very thing that every one of us would love 
We can be just like God. We can be God to somebody. We can be God over something. We can manage the whole situation. You can be just like God. And I'm sure Eve said, really? I thought we deserved a promotion. Well, you go on through the scripture and you will find pride addressed a lot. Solomon, in fact, addresses it quite a lot. There are more than 20 couplets in the book of Proverbs that deal with pride. And Solomon would know, after all, he was the richest and the wisest and the guy with the most horses and the most women. And, and Proverbs, the stuff that he writes, talks a lot about how easy it is to fall into pride and how dangerous it is and how much God doesn't like that. As much as it's a natural reaction of ours, he talks over and over. Proverbs 6, verse 17, it says what? There are six things the Lord hates. Yes, even seven. And I'll tell you what they are. And what's the very first one? Pride. How did you know that? I'm so proud of you. Haughty eyes. Pride. Yes. Pride. Haughty eyes. And then the psalmist goes on. Uh, the psalmist. The proverb writer Solomon goes on. He talks about a proud heart. He talks about eyelids lifted up in arrogance. He talks about boasting in gifts falsely. He says, you know what these are? They're clouds without rain. Promises of something, but nothing. He talks about pride a great deal. We're going to look at the New Testament today very quickly. And I, I want you, you'll, I think you'll see it on the slides and you'll see it on your paper. So we're just going to kind of walk through it. I'm going to mention a number of texts. One reason why I put this on the paper and the text there is because we're not going to look up every one of them. But they'll be in front of you. You can look at them later. In fact, I would recommend that. I would recommend you take some time today, this next week, and look up some of these texts, ponder them for a moment, and say, ooh, I guess I, should, I guess I should be thinking about this. I should let this scripture speak to me. There are five different words in the New Testament, five different Greek words. We always have fun with these Greek words, do we not? But they're translated pride, <clears throat> translated boasting, translated vainglory, high-minded, puffed up. The reason we look at them is because they are instructive. They give us a glimpse of ourselves. The first one we're going to look at, Aladzonia, is a word that means quack, as in imposter. Think snake oil salesman. Think about the guy who just rolls into town and he's got this thing he wants you to buy and he just goes on. You, you know, back in, back in a long, long, long time ago, believe it or not, I was a door-to-door -door salesman. Actually, I had a lot of fun as a door-to-door -door salesman. It was hard work. But you learn the spiel, and then you just go to door to door to door to door, knocking. You expect to get the door slammed in your face, what, seven out of ten times is what they tell you in sales school. But you just keep going. And I'd go up on the door, and, and actually, I, I do this to this day. And this was a long time ago when I did this. And I, I, you're trained to go up on the door. You should do this when you visit people, by the way. Stand at a 45. Don't be staring in through the screen. Stand at a 45 and, uh, you know, knock and then, and then put your hands in your pocket and whistle. <whistles> that way it puts them at ease when they see you. Okay, there's a little hint, just, just for future reference. You might need that. And then when she opens the door, you say, hi, Ms. Jones. Hopefully you know her name because you saw it on the mailbox or you saw it somewhere. You're looking for her. clues, right? So you say, hey, Ms. Jones, I've been out in the neighborhood talking to all the church folks. I'm selling Bible books. I've been talking to all the church folks. Like, they're so excited about something that I would like to take just a moment to show you today. I think you'll love exactly the same things your neighbors have been looking at and saying, yes, I want those. I don't think that's quite the spiel, but it's something like that. And I, I've thought about that so many times about that business of putting on a sales job. And of course, you, you're taught how to respond to, uh, to, um, to objections when they say, I don't need this. And so you respond to objections by saying, yes, ma'am, I know just what you mean. But then you go on with your thing. Well, you've heard it from the sales guy on the telephone as well, right? Who just keeps going. Yes, ma'am, I know what you mean. One, I remember one day I was down in Mississippi selling books and this lady looked at me through her door Asked her, I said about the fourth time, yes, ma'am, I know just what you mean, but you know, you're going to love this. And she said, boy, you don't know nothing. That, that, was, a, that was a wise word. <laughs> but I think often of that, you got the sales pitch, and it's, look at me. Let me tell you how impressive I am, even if I have to make some of it up. 
John uses this very word when he says, all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life. This is in 1 John 2, 16. He says, this is not from the Father. In James 4, 16, when James is talking about people who've got their whole lives planned out and they know exactly what they're going to do next and they got it all mapped and here they go. And he says, you better be careful because you can't map out your life. You don't know what's coming tomorrow. You boast in your arrogance and that boasting is evil. James 4, 16. The guy that inflates his credentials on his resume to seem more important or more authoritative or more impressive, that's this kind of imposter, this quackery. You know, there are folks who want to serve God, but they really only want to be his advisors. And this kind of imposter is just what this word means. The next word is mega laukeo. It's a good word. Mega, big, uh, strong, full. Laukos means neck. So guess what the word is? This word means um, to lift up the neck. Boasting, bragging. I'm trying to figure out what that looks like. Where does that phrase come from? Lift up the neck. Look at me. I got it all together. To lift up the neck, to boast, to brag. Look at me. Look how much better I am than you. I, I look down on you just a little from where I am because of what I've done and who I am. I've accomplished more and you're kind of down there. And I'm sorry about that. But I'm up here. Let me help you if I can. Nah, don't worry about you. James uses this word in James 3, 5 when he says, Your tongue boasts of great things, and it starts forest fires. You know, some people in church are kind and sweet and polite until you sit in their assigned chair. Or you disagree on how the church ought to be organized. Or you criticize endlessly about how things are. That's this kind of word. The next word is to follow. I, I love this because, yes, this word literally means to wrap in smoke. Tufos means smoke. And so this word is used by the Greeks to talk about somebody who does what? Blows a lot of smoke. Is filled with hot air. Almost exactly the same one for one kind of phrase. Look at me. I have a much nicer house than you. I've done more important things than you. My parenting skills are better than yours. I'm more spiritual than you. Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 2 through 4, and he says, you know, be careful people who are lovers of, of self, boastful, arrogant, treacherous, reckless, conceited. And that's the very word that I use. People who blow smoke. You don't want to be that. The next word is, it's a nice long word, Hupolofroneo. Now think about that. Hupo, we get our word hype, H-Y-P-E. Froneo means what? Mind. So hype or high and mind is what word? High-minded. It's translated often, high-minded. To think highly of yourself. Look at me. I got it all together. Sorry, you don't. What's wrong with you? You must be an idiot or weak. You know, I have to be careful. I, I hear myself say that. In fact, I said it just yesterday. I, I was talking about somebody. I said, he's an idiot. And I thought, oh, good grief. Well, aren't you working on a sermon? <laughs> Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, 17, and he says, instruct those who are rich in the world not to be high-minded, not to think too much of themselves. The last word is kenodoxia. The first part of that, kenos, kenos, means vain. Doxa means glory. The word means vain glory. We translate it exactly that way. Seeking respect and adulation, desperate for the applause of others, doing whatever it takes to build yourself up so that other people will see how great you are. Look at me. If I talk long enough about myself, you'll know how hard I've worked and how much I volunteer and how much I deserve your praise. I really think more of me than I do of you. And you should feel that way also. This is the guy who seeks vainglory. Paul writes to the Philippians about this, Philippians 2, 3, and he says, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, vain glory. He writes to the Galatians in Galatians 5, 26, Let us not become vainglorious, boastful, where we challenge one another and envy one another. 
those words speak. I don't know about you. I said this, this sermon is largely confessional for me. It's like, oh, I'm there every time I turn around. It's so easy to be critical of people. And that critical spirit comes from thinking I'm just a little bit better. A little further down the road. So what's the fundamental problem with this pride business? Number one, and you've got four, four points there. It short circuits what God wants to do with me. If I think I'm all that, if I see myself just a little above others, if I readily compare myself and see myself as better, then I will never be willing to let him shape me. I will be really quick to take the clay out of the potter's hand and say, I can do a better job. I'll take the brush away from the painter and say, I can paint a better picture of my life than you can. And when I do that, I will always come up wanting. I will come up short. I will not be content. I will be disappointed. It short circuits what God wants to do with me. But it also destroys the ability to see others the way God sees them. What happens when I am just fraught with this sense of, you know... I'm sorry about you, you're kind of dirty and scruffy or you got this or that and you don't, you don't measure up. If I think I'm all that, if I see myself as just a little smarter, wiser, and they're just a little lower, if I only see others through my preconceived notions and prejudices and judge them through my lenses, whether I say they're, they're young and they don't know any better or they're old and, and ignorant or they're dirty or lazy or loud or pushy or pierced or tattooed. If I label them from my lofty position and judge them as liberal or gay or Mexican or whatever, whatever epithet I might pull out to say, well, that's them. I'm me and that's them. Then I will never see their heart, will I? I will never see their heart. I'll never be able to look in their face and see through their eyes into their spirit. I'll never see where they're broken. I'll never see where they're needy. And I'll just march on. I'll never see them. I will never love them as God loves. It reminds me of a scene from a movie that came out a few years ago. How many of you remember uh, Bruce Almighty? In the movie, <clears throat> Bruce... Um, he's pretty sold on himself. And he, he encounters God. And God says, y you think you can handle this yourself? And Bruce says, well, sure I can. God says, well, why don't you be God for a few days? And Bruce really discovers in that process when he tries to fix things and answer, his prayer, answer prayers the right way and, and win the girl and shape her to be the way he wants her to be. When he realizes, uh-oh, it's a whole lot harder than he thought and he can't do it. And he's kind of at a point where he's basically dead. He's just finished. He can't go any further. And he finally wakes up. And he has this conversation with God. Morgan Freeman is God, by the way. And he does a really good God. Can I say that? <laughs> anyway. Bruce comes to him and he's just broken. And he's, his face is he's sad because he realizes he can't be God. And he can't fix her and make her the way he wants her to be. So you know what he says? God, I just want to see her the way you do. And God, Morgan Freeman's God, looks right at him in the eye and says, now that is a prayer. That's a prayer. I love that scene. You and I can walk with that. We can take that with us. <sighs> I can say, God, help me to see him. Help me to see her. Help me to, oh, forgive me for going there. Help me to see this person the way you see this person. To look past what's here. To look past my labels and prejudices and presuppositions and see this person. Let me, let me do that. It short circuits what God wants to do in me. It destroys the ability to see others the way that God sees them. It destroys the ability of real dialogue, conversation. If I think I'm all that, if I think I'm totally right, and if you disagree with me, you're not only wrong, but you're inferior. You ever, you ever hear that kind of argument made? The ad hominem argument where we tend to attack the other person as opposed to his or her argument is common in our day. If you disagree with me, you're not only wrong, but there's something wrong with you. 
And these days, there, is a lot, there are many, many, many polarizing issues, a lot of things that we face in our country, that we face in our churches, that are highly divisive and polarizing. And Christians have the obligation and the responsibility to not participate in the polarizing, divisive, broken, destructive kinds of dialogue that does go on in the world. We dare not assume a position that we got it all together, and if you all just join us, you'd be right. We've got to be really careful about that. Really careful. Christians have the obligation and the responsibility and the tools to be peacemakers, we should learn to listen and empathize and see another side, be able to engage humbly and calmly and graciously. That's what we ought to do. If we look at Jesus, when he engaged people of all kinds, even the people who hated him the most, we can take a lesson from that. That doesn't mean we don't have convictions and beliefs. It means what we don't have to be is puffed up, smoke-blowing, high-minded, conceited Pharisees. And that's where Christians can easily drift. So what ought we be doing? We ought to seek to understand as well as to be understood. We know we don't have all the answers. We can't often see a clear path to the solution. So we seek to learn. And you know what we do as much as anything else? And we read this in Ephesians 4.32. We extend grace just in the same way it's been extended to us. We've been recipients of a free, flowing, life-giving grace. We can learn how to extend that, even to people with whom we vehemently disagree, and see those people not as our enemies, but as people with whom we can engage because that's how God sees them. We can extend grace and put the interest of others ahead of our own. That's the starting point for a constructive dialogue and conversation. But the fourth thing, this kind of pride we're talking about seriously hinders sharing the gospel of Jesus. If I think I'm all that, if I think I'm just a little better than others, then I'm not going to look like him. Nor am I going to give much credibility to his life-changing Love, grace, forgiveness, and hope. My words about who he is and the sacrifice that he made and the emptying of himself for us will come up empty. You and I more than anything else. Man, I was listening to a song, listening to a, a CD while I was driving yesterday, and um, it was all instrumental. But the song, Behold the Lamb, big full orchestration man just I would have gone to my knees if I hadn't been driving then I would have been that guy so I just I just wept because I thought I I want to be in that choir with you I want to be in that choir with a whole bunch of other people who aren't here this morning in fact they're just out there somewhere and I, I, met, I met a guy in the Y this past week who said to me, we're on side by side on the treadmill. And he, you know what he's doing? He's a, he's a, he's a Chinese guy. He's, he's uh, uh, from mainland China. His English is kind of broken. But I've seen him numerous times and we strike up this conversation. And he is looking at something on his phone while he's on the treadmill. And I'm, I'm trying to get the game, okay? Because that's how spiritual I am. <clears throat> trying to get the game on the TV. And I glance over, he's looking at Joel Osteen. Now, whatever opinions you have of Joel, doesn't matter. Because I think, why is he watching that? And so I'm, we're going along and I said, hey, what are you looking at? And he said, oh, somebody told me I should watch this because I've had some hard times recently. And they said, this, it was just help me kind of grapple with life. I said, are you serious? And I said, working for you. And, and he, when, then we struck up this conversation. Before it was over, he gave me his phone number and he said, um, would you be willing to maybe to have coffee and talk more about this? And then he said, um, can I bring my wife? And I said, what are you doing Tuesday morning? Uh, you know, those, those opportunities, sometimes they arise, sometimes they don't come all that easily. 
But you know what I thought of when I heard that song, Behold the Lamb? I thought, I want that Chinese guy to be in that choir. That's what I thought, I, I want that. I want to be singing those songs with just as many people as we can get there. And you know what, if we hang on to the garbage that so easily encroaches and leaks out, we're not gonna do a very good job sharing that. Not, not very good. So let's think about what the response ought to be. Let's pray together, shall we? We're just gonna pray. Actually, this prayer is a time to listen. If you have a thought, if God has put something in your heart and you need to write it down, I challenge you to write it down and say, God, uh, help me to be different. If there's a decision you need to make right in this moment where you say, God, I've kind of gone away from you, this is where you say, bring me back. If, if there's a place maybe in this church where you need to be more engaged, this is the time to say, okay, my, my pride or whatever has kept me from going there. Show me how to do that. <clears throat> how do we respond when we look at ourselves in the mirror and see, see this stuff? I'm going to read this prayer that <clears throat> I bet I read two or three times a week. I should have it memorized. But it speaks so deeply to my heart. <clears throat> Father, forgive me. Forgive me. And the psalmist writes this, Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to your greatness and your compassion. Blot out my transgressions and wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from sin. I know my transgressions. My sin is ever before me, and I have sinned against you. And you are justified. You're perfectly within your rights and blameless when you judge me. Purify me with hyssop and make me clean. Wash me, make me whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Hide your face from my sins, blot out my iniquities. Clean, create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me, but restore to me the joy of your salvation. Sustain me with a willing spirit. Oh God, forgive me, deliver me. I know you don't delight in sacrifice. You're not pleased with burnt offerings. What you want are a broken and contrite spirit. Father, I'm a sinner like everyone else. <laughs> forgive me for my pride. Father, remind me of what I am. Remind me, like Isaiah said, that I have gone astray it's like a dumb sheep, that I deserve death, that I make myself out to be something when I'm really nothing. Remind me, oh God, how much I need you. Remind me that I was once in trespasses and sin and dead, that I was lost and could not find my way and had no hope. But you being rich in mercy because of your great love with which you loved us. Even when I was dead in transgressions, you made me alive together with Christ and raised me up with him and seated me with him. In the heavenly places. Remind me, O oh God, that I've been saved by grace through faith and not of myself. It's your free gift. And it's a, not a result of anything I've done so that I cannot brag. Remind me, Father, of what I am. And I pray that you'd make me like Jesus. Make me like Jesus. So that I hear these words. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit and pride, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. 
Don't merely look out for your own personal interest, but look out for the interests of others. And have this attitude in you, in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself. He emptied himself and took the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name. Oh God, may it be that I, along with Paul, can say, let me know nothing except Jesus. To say with John, he must increase, I must decrease. Change my heart so that I put others first. Change the way I talk so that I will build people up and not tear them down. And change the way that I walk, change my habits to crucify the flesh. I know that in Christ, the old self is crucified, that I've been crucified with Christ. Lord, may I live that out. May I live that out.